in our lab, we are very interested in studying the sense of touch and proprioception. And we do that mostly with basic science, uh, studying monkeys and humans and implanting electrodes in their brain. But also we use the insights from our studies to inform the brain machine interfaces, which I'm going to talk about today. So it's been established in the past a few years that the sensory feedback in neuroprosthetics is extremely impor important for facilitating motor control. And to demonstrate this point, I'm going to show you a video, if I can figure out how to click this. All right, so here you can see a tetraplegic patient who is paralyzed, and he has two implants in his brain. One of them is in the motor cortex, which is used to control this robotic hand that you can see in the video. And another implant is in the somewhat sensory cortex, which is used to uh, deliver intracortical stimulation, which induces touch in this patient whenever he touches any object. So it's easy to see that uh, the videos on the left with stimulation uh, elicit faster, a faster movement and more precise movement than those without stimulation. And if you're one of those people who do not believe in um, judging by the videos, here is some statistics for you. Uh, here are some statistics showing the performance with and without stimulation. As, and you can see, uh, performance with stimulation is uh, much more precise, and so the patient uh, is able to accomplish more trials with stimulation than without. Um, so this, uh, this study is done in the cortex. However, before the sensory, uh, sensory signals reach the cortex, they go through several stages of processing. So let's look into them. So first, the, uh, when we interact with an object, the receptors of the skin, uh, of joints and muscles get activated, and then the signals get uh, transmitted through the nerve into the spinal cord, and then eventually synapse in the brain stem in structures such as cuneate nucleus. After that, they go into the thalamus and eventually arrive to the cortex. All of those stages require certain processing, and most of that we really don't know at this point. And the best part we know so far is the nerve. So starting from here, I'm going to talk mostly about the peripheral signals and how we can use them to facilitate brain machine interfaces. Um, so our lab is a big believer in trying to make uh, sensory feedback as close to realistic as possible, so as if the patient was intact. So for that, we need to study how the nerve processes sensory information in the first place. Uh, so usually that's done by recording from single afferents in monkeys or humans and trying to describe their responses. However, the nerve uh, contains thousands of those afferents. And to be able to describe what the whole nerve is doing, we need to somehow model that. So these two postdocs, uh, Ben and Hannes, in our lab has developed this model which allows to do so. And what the model allows is uh, to simulate all the afferents on the palmar surface of the hand. Uh, the afferents are called SA1, R RA, and PCs. Uh, and um, to, as a result, model their activation um, based on any kind of stimulus you want to apply, which can be in 2D with different, um, different uh, forces applied to different contexts. Uh, so this model uses integrate and fire um, neuron model and uh, all those parameters in red circles are trained using the real data. And as a result, you can get the firing of all the efferents uh, that you can see on the right. Uh, so this is all good, but uh, how to use this in brain machine interfaces is uh, a very complicated question because unfortunately at the moment, all the technologies we have are only able to stimulate at, at like about 20 points or so, not more than that. But there are thousands of afferents out there in the nerve. So we cannot uh, any possibly stimulate each one of them uh, individually. So we have to come up with certain algorithm that would be able to converge all those inputs together and deliver them to the nerve. So for that, we have developed an easier version of this algorithm in which we um, we collapse all the signals from the afferents into one firing rate that you can see uh, on the right. Uh, and we train um, a very easy model that tries to map from the stimulus into the firing rate. And then we use this firing rate estimate to try to modulate the frequency of stimulation that we deliver directly to the subject. 
So if you look at uh, performance, this is how well we can uh, uh, can mimic the actual uh, nerve activity and our model does a pretty good job and much better than previous models describing the nerve. And uh, you might ask how is this doing in real patients and here are some results which we did in collaboration with the University of Utah and most of those uh, experiments were done by this grad student uh, um, Greg George and uh, what he did, he uh, implanted uh, uterus in um, all uh, per peripheral nerves, somatosensory nerves, of a patient who has lost his arm. Uh, and at the same time, they implanted uh, electrodes in the muscles of the patient so that he can operate the, this deca Luke arm that allows you to grab different objects. So on the right, you can see the map of uh, projection fields, uh, which means that uh, the point where the patient was feeling sensation whenever we stimulated one of the electrodes in a nerve. And as you can see, we have a pretty big span of uh, different sensations, of different qualities around the whole um, polymer surface of the hand. Uh, so then we tried to test uh, whether somatosensory feedback allows to uh, improve motor control of this patient. And as you can see in this um, study in which the patient was grasping and holding on to different objects with various sizes and compliance, uh, he was doing much better job with stimulation than without. So the gray bars uh, show that he has better success rates, uh, it takes less time, and uh, what is more important, his uh, movements are more accurate, meaning that um, he doesn't have to move so much uh, when he's trying to do something. Uh, then we try to uh, apply our biomimetic type of uh, model to uh, show whether uh, it improves performance or not comparing to the standard one. And as you can see, uh, the gray bar, which is like a very standard approach to stimulate the nerve, uh, takes much more time to accomplish the task than uh, that based on our model. Um, this is another project we're doing with our lab. So when we think about neuroprosthetics, we usually think about the arm and the hand. However, we uh, forget to take into account that actually most of the amputees are lower limb amputees, and they also require uh, neuroprosthetics. And it's uh, kind of a big problem, because if you think about dropping the cup, it's not that such a big of a problem. But if you think of dropping yourself, that can be a big problem. So um, developing those prosthetics that can feel where you're stepping is a big challenge in the field. So together with these guys from Pittsburgh, we're trying to develop uh, ways to stimulate the nerve uh, of the lower limb to be able to elicit sensations. So how we do this? So this is the cross section of the spinal cord. And you can see here dorsal root ganglia, which contain the uh, cell bodies of uh, somatosensory um, neurons. So what we do, we put um, grids of arrays on top of the um, dorsal root ganglia and through those uh, electrodes we stimulate uh, directly the cells that are underneath it. Uh, so this is very preliminary result. So the patient was implanted with this uh, technology for a month and he was taken at home to stimulate himself whenever he was walking with the prosthesis. And as you can see, in the first week, uh, most of the sensations were localized above amputation, so in the residual leg. However, after the electrodes settled, uh, we could see that the stimulation moved towards the phantom limb. So this is very promising, because now we can elicit sensations in the, in the leg that is not there. And on top of that, a very important factor is uh, decreasing the amount of pain those patients have. So there is some evidence that if we stimulate the nerve, the patients might feel less pain from the amputation. And this was in ca uh, indeed the case in our uh, study. So the purple line shows that the pain indeed decreases uh, after stimulation. And we also do some of the uh, psychophysics studies, which I can talk about in questions. Um, so what's next? Uh, sure. Uh, the next is uh, in the field is to create, uh, first of all, uh, stable and accurate and safe technologies for people to be able to stimulate the nerve and the brain. And so far as I've shown, uh, it's actually a big challenge. 
Uh, then what our lab does is to create uh, stimulation algorithms that would be as close as possible to the actual biological nerve. Uh, then what Anton probably will tell you about uh, later is creating good robotic devices that will be able to control not only one or two degrees of freedom, but much more than that, which is similar to our actual biological hand. Uh, then clinical trials, obviously, and proprioceptive feedback is something that uh, people haven't really studied before. Uh, with that, I'd like to say thanks to my lab uh, and the people who participated in the studies, as well as our collaborators from Utah and Pittsburgh. Thank you, and I'll take any questions.
biomedical neuroscience, and I'm going to be talking about the main project that we had in our lab uh, for the past five years that was sponsored by DARPA. It's uh, control of uh, myoelectric prosthetics, and specifically biomimetic approach to it, and why is that important, and uh, how we can use it in the future in other ways. Uh, so first, why do we do that? Uh, movement is extremely important. Uh, it's the only way that a uh, human can interact with the outside world and uh, express their will and uh, uh, be productive and uh, in general live. And uh, whenever you lose a limb, uh, it severely lowers the quality of life uh, and uh, makes life much, much harder. Uh, here you can see two examples uh, of uh, prosthetics. Uh, on the left is uh, Autobock. Uh, leg, and on the right is a uh, concept art for uh, DARPA haptics prosthetic, and uh, the left one uh, is one of the best developed prosthetics right now for the leg, uh, because it uh, interprets the biomechanics uh, in its design and uh, uh, allows more intuitive control of uh, the leg, uh, not requiring a person to think about it really. And uh, the prosthetic on the right, uh, its uh, concept was to create uh, something that you can just put on and it will work for you right away without long training that is required commonly in existing prosthetic devices. And uh, as you can see, uh, maybe not from these ones, but in general from the prosthetics that you see every day in life, uh, they're uh, not very complex. Uh, they may allow you several degrees of freedom, uh, but they're very far from the complexity that you can do with uh, your real human hand. And uh, I believe, and we believe, that a uh, real next generation of prosthetics will only be created whenever we understand how the real biological system is being controlled. And when we use uh, our knowledge of that system to uh, inspire us and to create uh, something more complex. And uh, that's what we do in our design for the controller. So how the myoelectric prosthetic works. Uh, first, uh, you take the electrical signals from the hand. Here you can see uh, some surface electrodes placed on the muscles uh, and uh, you record electrical activity from them. They don't have to be surface. They can be intramuscular or you can record from nerves or some kind of uh, other uh, signals that can be interpreted, you process them uh, somehow and you treat the electrical signal from a muscle as uh, its level of contraction. So how hard the muscle is contracting. Then you go through this mystical box of uh, musculoskeletal dynamics uh, which produces torque uh, which then can be simulated in some kind of physical engine and uh, create kinematics that can be used to drive a prosthetic. And uh, of course the most important and complex part in here is the musculoskeletal dynamics, which uh, I'm going to be talking about today. How do we do that? So first, the basic part of the uh, musculoskeletal system is a uh, segment. Uh, and uh, here, for example, you can see two simple seg segments uh, it's, well, of your arm, uh, which are connected by a joint. And the joint can uh, have one degree of freedom, like your elbow, which just flexes and extends, uh, or it can have multiple degrees of freedom, like your wrist, which can flex, extend, pronate, supinate, and uh, abduct, adduct. And uh, um, these uh, segments, uh, they rotate around each other, and uh, because forces are pulling on them. And uh, the easiest one is, of course, the force of gravity, but uh, our, willing, uh, our will is expressed through the muscle contractions, which are pulling on the muscle, on when muscles are producing forces, they're pulling on the joint, and uh, the proportion of the action that the muscle can do around this joint uh, and specific degree of freedom is related to the moment arm uh, around uh, this degree of freedom. So it's uh, the distance between the muscle path and the joint, um, degree of freedom axis of rotation. And uh, it's one proportional is to the other. And the other part of this produced torque uh, rotational is the force, which depends on the 
your voluntary contraction level. So there are many models for how to express these, uh, the force that a muscle is producing. And uh, the one that we're using, the most popular one, is the heel type muscle model, which has two parts. It's the active part and the passive part. Uh, active part depends on your voluntary contraction level. And uh, both of them depend on uh, the muscle length. So the longer the muscle, usually the stronger the force it can produce. And uh, from here you can see that we need to model uh, two very important kinematic variables. It's the moment arms, which are dependent on the current position, and uh, it's the muscle length, uh, which is also dependent on the current position. How do we do that? Through uh, software called uh, OpenSim, uh, which allows you to create paths in uh, geometric space and uh, connect to dots. And uh, it, here is the reason why not so many people ever tried to use uh, biomimetic modeling for any kind of control or in general think about it because it's extremely complicated. Uh, we've been working on this model for the past five years and uh, we were able to verify the parameters of 33 muscular tendon actuators around 18 degrees of freedom from more than 100 publications online from preparations uh, and anatomy exploration and uh, so on. It's an extremely tedious job uh, but uh, that a lot of my collaborators worked on and uh, it's uh, still somewhat ongoing. So what uh, that software OpenSim uh, allows you to simulate the muscles, but uh, let's look at these variables in a little bit more detail. First, this extensor carpi ulnaris muscle, a very simple wrist extensor. Uh, here are its uh, surfaces for the variables. On top is the uh, muscle length and on the bottom are its moment arms uh, which are as you can see it's some kind of surfaces that are changing based on how your wrist is located. Uh, the usual way to do to obtain these values is to simulate them but simulation takes time. Uh, so many people started using splines uh, just connecting those dots uh, with piecewise functions. Uh, but the problem is that ECU is simple, it's two degrees of freedom, but some of the thumb muscles uh, span up to six degrees of freedom, which makes it a six dimensional muscle uh, with about 200 gigabytes of uh, parameters uh, that are needed to simulate it, which is of course not feasible in any kind of control. It's unstable and uh, in general, a very bad idea. So we've developed a uh, polynomial approximation that generates uh, extremely small results, and I'm not going to bore you with details, but just the results. We can simulate those values with uh, tiny errors, less than 5%, uh, 10 million less parameters than the splines, uh, just some 70 kilobytes of memory, and it can be evaluated within 10 microseconds, uh, which allows us to fully control the uh, hand uh, with a two millisecond loop. So it's extremely responsive, extremely fast. Uh, and uh, more importantly, it scales linearly. So the more complex muscles you have, uh, your model does not explode and you can expand to have more and more complex models in the future or whenever you are trying to model something even more complex. So that was uh, just methods and details, which are important, but of course the videos are more interesting. Here uh, is my good friend collaborator, Matthew. Uh, he's equipped with, uh, uh, I believe, eight or 10 uh, surface uh, electrodes on his forearm. Uh, and uh, he, on the background, is uh, the fully simulated uh, model of the hand uh, with 17 completely unconstrained degrees of freedom. And, uh, uh, yeah. See, will it play? Will it? No, it won't play. So here's the performance. He can flex extend uh, his uh, fingers. Uh, he can uh, flex extend the wrist, uh, move uh, the wrist while his uh, hand is flexed. Uh, the response is extremely fast. Uh, he can pronate, supinate, he can control his thumb. And uh, all of this is done only with the uh, surface electrodes and uh, no training. So the uh, electrodes were put on, uh, scaled the signals, and uh, it's, uh, it's moving and working. 
and uh, of course this is a uh, healthy subject, but we're working for uh, amputees, and uh, here it's a very old experiment, it's been done about four years ago, but just to show you that uh, we can do uh, the experiment. Okay, so relax again. Okay, make a fist. Okay, relax. And just bring your index finger in. Okay, hold it in and relax again. Okay, can you stick all your fingers out straight? Nice and straight, fingers out. Okay, relax. Okay, flex your wrist in. Bring your wrist in. Make a fist and bring your hand in. Yeah, period. Now put your fingers out. Can you put your fingers out and keep your wrist in? Almost. Yeah. Okay, relax. I think everyone, uh, if you want to talk about a little bit more in detail about this, and uh, here are the uh, to acknowledge our colleagues uh, at uh, Pittsburgh who did most of the physical experiments and our two labs at West Virginia University who are working on the controller. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer.